Hello class, today we're going to discuss four-dimensionalism, the remaining proposed solution to the puzzle of material constitution, as explained by Ted Sider. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. What does four-dimensionalism deny? 2. What is four-dimensionalism specifically? 3. What does four-dimensionalism imply about material objects? 4. How does four-dimensionalism avoid the similarity objection to cohabitation theory? 5. What is the holding objection to four-dimensionalism? 6. What is the aging objection to four-dimensionalism? All right, as always, when I give the answers to these questions, you'll want to pause the video to type them up or write them out or crochet them into a sweater or hammer them into a knife sculpture, however it is that you best compartmentalize the information. So, when we last left off, we had looked at a few solutions to the puzzle of material constitution. We've looked at the just matter theory, the takeover theory, muriological nihilism, and cohabitation theory. Now we're going to look at a different theory, the one that Ted Sider defends. This theory, four-dimensionalism, also denies the assumption called absurdity. Both cohabitation theory and four-dimensionalism deny the same assumption in the puzzle of material constitution, in other words. But they differ in the explanation for their denial. The cohabitation theorist simply denies the assumption of absurdity and flat-footedly says you can have two things in exactly the same place at once, that's it. The four-dimensionalist has an explanation for why you can have two things in exactly the same place at once. According to the four-dimensionalist, objects, material objects, have temporal parts. That's what four-dimensionalism says specifically, that material objects have temporal parts as well as spatial parts. Another way to put this is to say that material objects, according to the four-dimensionalist, are stretched out across time in the same way that they're stretched out across space. And in order to get a clear handle on what the four-dimensionalist is saying, or what this means, let's consider a very elongated object, one that's stretched out across space. Highway I-5. The Highway I-5, Interstate 5, stretches out across California, up through Oregon, and through Washington. It's a very long road covering each state in the western coast. Now because I-5 is stretched out across these three states, it's not true that all of it is in California, or that all of it is in Oregon, or that all of it is in Washington. Because I-5 is stretched out across three states, we can say that it's got a part that's in Oregon, a part that's in Washington, and a part that's in California. And we can subdivide those parts too. We can say there's the part of I-5 that's in the northern half of California. We can say that there's a part of I-5 that's in the southern half of California. And we can subdivide them further. In this way, we are dividing I-5 into its spatial parts, and its spatial parts of its spatial parts, and so on. Now, although you and I are different from I-5 in many ways, we are alike in the sense that we can be divided into our spatial parts too. In the same way that I-5 has an Oregon part, and a Washington part, and a California part, so do we have a left half, and a right half, a top half, and a bottom half, and we can be subdivided into specific parts, spatially speaking. Those are our spatial parts. Now according to the four-dimensionalist, objects are stretched out across time in the way that I-5 is stretched out across space. Imagine that there is a timeline, and that on that timeline we represent your personal history. And for every little notch in this timeline, we've got you doing something at that moment in time represented by the notch. And if we are to treat all of these different depictions of you at each notch as one continuous object, we could imagine slicing that object or dividing it up along the timeline so that we've got a part of your history that's represented on a Monday, and a part of your history that's on a Tuesday, and a part of your history that's on a Wednesday, and so on. The four-dimensionalist thinks that you are that elongated object across time. 
that in the same way Highway I-5 has an Oregon part and a California part, so do you have a Monday part and a Tuesday part and a Wednesday part. That we can divide you across time with temporal parts in the same way that we can divide up I-5 across space with different spatial parts. In the same way that no single state in the United States has all of I-5 in it, and that I-5 is stretched out across many states, so, claims the four-dimensionalist, there's no moment in time where you are entirely present. You are stretched out across many times. So part of you is present today watching this very video lecture, and a different part of you existed yesterday that was not watching this video lecture. And this is nothing special about you, of course. According to the Four Dimensionalist, all material objects are like this. They're stretched out across time in the same way that they're stretched out across space. In the same way that Highway I-5 stretches out from California up through Washington, we might speak of an object, like a statue, existing from 1980 until 2001. It's stretched out from 1980 until 2001, and it's got different parts at those times. If you think about how an event is structured, you'll note that events do have temporal parts. Consider the event of a football game. We can say that the football game is divided into a first half and a second half, and you can divide those halves further into quarters, and you can divide those quarters further into plays, and so on. Or consider the event of an earthquake. An earthquake has a first half and a second half, and we can subdivide those halves and subdivide those bits, and we can talk about the temporal parts of an earthquake in the same way that we might talk about the temporal parts of a football game. The stages of an event are its temporal parts. Four-dimensionalists think that material objects have stages, which are their parts, in the same way that events have stages, which are their parts. A coffee mug, according to a four-dimensionalist, has a first half and a second half, and we can divide the halves of the coffee mug further into the first quarter of it, and the second quarter of it, and the third quarter of it. And the entire coffee mug would be all of its history taken together for every moment at which it exists. Now, here's a question. How does the four-dimensionalist solve the puzzle of material constitution? Here's how. The statue, according to the four-dimensionalist, is part of the clay. If you consider the clay, all of the clay, all of it stretched out across time, you'll note that only some of it is statue-shaped. And if we consider all of the temporal parts of the clay which are statue-shaped, that would be the statue. And in this way, the statue is a section of the clay. It's part of the clay. It's a temporal part of the clay. So, the clay and the statue are in the same place at once. However, this is just a case of something being present where its parts are. It's not true that all of the statue and all of the clay are together in exactly the same space-time region. For there are plenty of regions where the clay is, but the statue is not. Since there are regions of space-time where the clay is and the statue isn't, this allows us to say that the statue is just part of the clay. And this means that their co-location is not as problematic as it might initially seem. Consider your own hand. Wherever your hand is, you're there too. If your hand is touching a steering wheel, then you are touching a steering wheel. If your hand is feeling a cold breeze, then you are feeling a cold breeze. If your hand picks a flower, then you pick a flower. So you are present where your hand is present. In this sense, you're in the same place at once. But is this a surprising metaphysical puzzle that should scare us, shock us, and force us to do some philosophy? No, of course not. It's not like all of you is present where your hand is. It's not as though every single bit of you is co-located with your hand. There are plenty of parts of you that are not present where your hand is. 
You are partially present where your hand is entirely present. That's just how parts work. Likewise, the clay is present where the statue is. If someone picks up the statue, they pick up the lump of clay. If someone sees the statue, they see the lump of clay. If someone strikes the statue with a hammer, they strike the lump of clay with a hammer, and so on. But according to the Four Dimensionalist, this should not be anything mysterious or problematic. The clay is partially present where the statue is entirely present. For that length of time in which the statue exists, that's all of the statue, but it's only some of the lump of clay, in the same way that in the region of space where my hand is, that's all of my hand, but only some of me. There's nothing problematic in something having spatial parts and being partially present wherever one of its spatial parts is entirely present. Likewise, claims the Four Dimensionalist, there's nothing problematic about something being present where its temporal parts are, and only partially. The statue is just part of the lump of clay, and so, when they're co-located, that's just one thing being co-located with one of its parts, an ordinary phenomenon that you can understand as soon as you consider you and your hand. So that's how the Four Dimensionalist solves the puzzle of material constitution, or how they allegedly solve it. And when we take a look at the similarity objection to cohabitation theory, which we covered in the previous lecture, we can see how the Four Dimensionalist avoids it. The cohabitation theorist was troubled by this issue that, according to them, you can have two things that are exactly similar, but which differ in what they can undergo and survive. And that seems absurd. According to the cohabitation theorist, the statue and the lump of clay are as alike as can be, but only one of them can survive being squished? How bizarre. The four dimensionalist can solve this. According to the four dimensionalist, the statue and the lump of clay are not exactly alike. They're quite different. The clay is stretched out and exists in places and times where the statue does not. They're not exactly similar. Since they're not exactly similar, there's no absurdity in there being a difference in what they can undergo and what their persistence conditions are. So the similarity objection is no problem for the four-dimensionalist. And yet, the four-dimensionalist does face a couple of objections. The main problem with four-dimensionalism is that it completely revises our view of what material objects are. To understand a first objection, the holding objection, let's just consider this, that it's possible to hold an entire house key in your hand. That should be a piece of data, that's just something we know from ordinary experience. That a house key is the type of thing that you can hold in your hand. And not just part of a house key, but all of it. An entire house key should fit in your hand. That's an ordinary assumption that seems perfectly innocent. But if four-dimensionalism is true, you can't hold an entire house key in your hand, or it would be very rare for anyone to do so. Because when you consider the entirety of a house key, that includes all of its various temporal stages. That includes every moment in time in which it exists, all of its history. Nobody holds a house key from the moment it begins to exist until the moment it is destroyed. And yet, that's what would be required, according to Four Dimensionalism, to hold an entire house key in your hand. That's the holding objection, that you can hold an entire house key in your hand. If four-dimensionalism is true, you cannot hold an entire house key in your hand. Therefore, four-dimensionalism is not true. And when you consider the spirit of the holding objection and think about all kinds of objects, it suddenly becomes a serious problem. Did you think you could clean your whole room? Or own a whole plot of land? Carry a whole bicycle across the driveway? Not according to four-dimensionalism. According to four-dimensionalism, only part of you interacts with parts of various objects. Part of you holds part of a mug of part of some coffee, and part of you carries part of a bicycle across part of a driveway. You only hold parts of keys and meet parts of people, and it starts to look a little silly. The very idea of interacting with a whole object disappears once you accept the four-dimensionalist view. And that you might mark as something against it. In addition to this, there's also what we might call the aging objection. And that goes something like this. It's possible for a whole object to get older. If four-dimensionalism is true, 
no entire object can get older. So, four-dimensionalism is not true. My dog is getting older. That seems to be true. And not just part of my dog, but my dog, all of my dog is getting older. Yet according to four-dimensionalism, my dog, my whole dog, is stretched out across time, fixed there for all of its history in perpetuity. And that thing does not get older. Nothing happens to my dog in that sense. My dog just has all of these stages distributed across history, and always they will be so distributed, and always they were so distributed. It does not age, it does not change, it just sticks there in a static space-time continuum. And so for everything, really. Nothing truly ages, according to four-dimensionalism. An entire object is stretched out across history, in a way where it doesn't really age, at least not all of it. We could talk about the parts of an object seeming more aged than its previous parts, and we can talk about the way in which an object's parts seem to vary as it gets closer to the edge of its being. But an entire object does not really age, nor does anything happen to it. This may be some good news if you're afraid of aging, but it certainly fails to capture our ordinary judgments about objects and how the world seems to be, and that's a problem. So, that's a brief introduction to four-dimensionalism. There are, of course, whole books written about four-dimensionalism. Here's one of them. Ted Sider wrote this one, in fact. He wrote the book on four-dimensionalism. And that is where we're going to leave it. Next, we're going to talk about a different version of myriological nihilism, which we haven't looked at so far, the monist version. Thanks for watching. See you next time.